Data in education, it's our superpower. And with great power comes great responsibility, if we choose to use it. If we don't, that's a whole nother story. I was so excited to get selected to do this talk. I had a great opening, great introduction, I thought. It went something like this. Imagine you're a superhero with superpowers, but you choose not to use them. For example, Superman decides he's not gonna fly. He can't leap tall buildings in a single bound. Spider-Man chooses to ignore his spidey sense so he doesn't know that there's danger around the corner. Batman, Batman chooses not to use his... So Batman doesn't have a superpower. Batman has toys, gadgets, but he doesn't have a superpower. I needed an audience to practice on, and I thought, my son Zachary. Let me tell you a little bit about Zach. Zach's 25, he lives with me, he's on the autism spectrum. Now Zach knows a lot of things about a lot of things. He knows a whole bunch about World War II, he knows where words are derived from. He knows how language has developed. He knows things about science. He just knows a lot. So I'm practicing my opener on him because he also knows a lot about superheroes. I get to the Batman part, which I thought was funny. And he says, Dad, Batman has a superpower. No, Zach, he, he really doesn't. He said, yes, his superpower is his intellect. I'm like, okay, I don't think so, Zach. But being the responsible father, I decided to get on the internet and Google what is Batman's superpower? His intellect. <laughs> his intellect, his wealth, and his keen detecting abilities. Now, they also go on to say that he is the greatest detective in the world. Now, that's where I draw the line, because we all know Sherlock Holmes is the greatest detective, but we'll put that aside. So Batman, intellect. Now, what if our superheroes decided they're not going to use their superpower? It doesn't do any good. For us in education, data is a superpower, and it can really do some marvelous things if we choose to use it. A few months ago, I went to the doctor. We've all been through the situation. You go in, you check up at the front desk, they tell you to have a seat. You have your seat. A few minutes later, the nurse calls your name, and you start walking back. And before we even get to the exam room, What's the first thing that they do? They weigh you. So this is a separate data talk, but I think the data on those scales is wrong. <laughs> Every time, for me at least. So we go into the exam room, and she opens up the computer, starts putting in some notes, puts that thing, that pulse oximeter thing, whatever it's called, on my finger, and then she puts the cuff on for my blood pressure. I'm in a doctor's office, so I know my blood pressure is probably a little elevated already. So I'm doing everything I know to lower my blood pressure. I'm breathing slower. I'm doing some internal meditation. My eyes are closed. She's going <laughs> pumping up that cuff. My legs are hanging straight, right? If you cross your legs, it increases your blood pressure. Did you know that? I'm meditating, I'm like, okay, my blood pressure is gonna be nice and low. And then I hear, huh. I look over at the nurse and go, huh, what? <laughs> That's not a good sound to hear. 
Well, she ignores me. She finishes. She says, the doctor will be with you in a few minutes. She walks out. Knock on the door. Doctor walks in. Hi, Rick. How are you doing? I've never understood that question. I'm in a doctor's office. I'm obviously not the epitome of health if I'm here. How am I doing? Probably not good. She sits down, starts looking at the information in the computer, and then she pulls up my blood pressure information. Information is just another word for data. Now I have this data, this information that I can choose to ignore, which may have a not so good effect on the rest of my life, or I can do something with it. I can make a decision then and there to do something about this piece of information that I have. I think we can all agree, education has gone pretty digital at this point. Not everything, but a lot of it. And I can tell you that I know this because I do work here at an education service center in Austin. We support 70 school districts, and within those, there are over 600 campuses, K through 12. We have kindergarten through 12th grade campuses just in the central Austin area. Those campuses and districts, about 95% of them are using one of two different software applications. And it's got multiple parts, but the main part of it is assessment. Tests, creating tests, right? We have to test kids. We have to know where they are, what they're doing. How do we get better? Anywhere from a teacher, instructional coach, campus leader, district leader, they can go in and create these tests. And it's really pretty simple. You can go in and you can just take a test and make a copy of it, pretty easy. You can create a shell and then you can select what they call from item banks, any question you want that's gonna assess what's on this unit, this lesson. Or you could even go in and create your own items. So you can do all these different things. And then it's really as simple as flipping a switch. You turn it on, it's online, student goes in, takes the assessment, clicks submit. Guess what, you have data that quick. We have so much data at our fingertips, but it's what we do with that data that's gonna make a big difference. Imagine you're looking at this huge spreadsheet. It can be intimidating, overwhelming, scary. You ever think about that when, you, when the word data comes up? It's like, ugh. So here's this big spreadsheet. Let me kind of paint this picture for you. Along the left-hand side, you have a list of all your students. Coming across the top, you have the questions. Let's just say there's 10 questions, one through 10. Underneath each question is the standard or the skill that you are assessing on this test. And then in the middle are all these cells, all these squares, with every answer that the student picked. If they got it right, it's green. If they got it wrong, it's red. And there's all this data. That's a lot to take in at once. But what if we could just take a piece of that? For example, student A. If we take student A and we follow across, they got everything right except for one question. What does that tell me? That means this student probably has a grasp on this concept, and they got one wrong. But you know what? I can go look at that question, I can look at what they picked for an answer, and I have data that tells me what I can do tomorrow to help that student with that one skill. It's data, but it's not overwhelming when you take it apart. Let's look at student K. We come across and student K got everything wrong except for one question. They probably guessed and got lucky on that one. Now, I don't know, but maybe student K woke up in a bad mood, didn't get breakfast, got to school late. Maybe student K was out all last week, sick. 
Maybe student K really is having a hard time grasping this concept on this lesson. But you know what? Now I have data. I can look at this and I can make an immediate pedagogical decision tomorrow what I'm going to do to help the student. We have this, this stigma around data that it's scary and it's overwhelming. But if we look at it piece by piece, it's not. Let's look at question number two. See it? Question number two, 90% of the students got question two right. I don't need to do a whole class reteach, but I do need to pull out those students and do a small group. What about question seven? Question seven, 85% of the students got it wrong, and every wrong answer was the same wrong answer. It's a piece of data. It's just a piece of information. But what does that tell me? Maybe there was a vocabulary word in there that threw them off. Maybe it was a distractor answer. Maybe it was a poorly worded question. Or maybe I didn't teach that concept very well. But you know what? I can go and figure that out from that one piece of data and fix that tomorrow. This data is going to help us affect our bottom line. And what's our bottom line in education? Student success. The more student success we have, the better we're doing. And that's what we ultimately want to do. So we have to take a look at putting these great data cultures in place. But you can't just throw this out and say, hey guys, we're going to do data culture. Great goal. If I had a goal to lose 20 pounds, which I do. If that's just my goal, that's all it is. It's just an idea. But what if I put a plan in place? And this might not be the best plan, but I'm gonna wake up early, I'm gonna exercise 20 minutes a day, I'm gonna reduce my portion sizes, I'm gonna cut out carbohydrates, and I'm gonna cut out gluten, and I'm gonna reduce my sugar, and I'm gonna weigh myself. Well, now there's a better chance of hitting that goal. And weighing myself, there's some data there. But that's a plan. So we have to put a plan in place. I read a book by James Clear, Atomic Habits. One of the most uh, instructful things I think that I got out of that book was this quote. We don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. Think about that. We don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. So if you're gonna to try to build a culture, a data culture in your schools and your districts, we're talking about change management. Now, if you go online and you look up what is change management, you can get every possible description that you can imagine. The five golden rules to change management. The three tricks to get change management working for you. The one thing you need for change management. Well, today, ladies and gentlemen, you get my four ideas for change management. One, tell them what. We don't want to leave people in the dark. What are we going to do? We're going to implement a data culture. We're going to do this so that we can do certain things within our campus and district, but we're going to implement a data culture so you have tools to work with. Why? One, it's good for kids. We can look at data that's at our fingertips and we can make, make immediate decisions on how that's going to affect their success. Tell them how. How are we going to do this? We're going to look at unit assessments. We're going to do it weekly. We're going to do it in a PLC, professional learning communities. We're going to do it in the principal's office. That third part, that takes some finesse, right? That takes a little bit more planning to make sure how that's all going to work. And four, we need to let them know that they're going to be supported. We're going to provide professional development. We're going to provide ongoing training. It can't be a one and done. Hey, here's how you look at data. Go do it. 
We all know that doesn't work. We've all been to things where you get one time and it sounds great, but there's no follow through. We have to follow up. We have to say, we're going to support you. We're going to check on you. The data is not a gotcha. It's not to say you're doing bad or you're doing good. It's what are we doing to help support our kids? We're going to do a temperature check. How's it going? Do you need more support? Do you need more training? Can we form a collaborative group? It's pretty simple, but I don't think we do that enough. In education, how many people? Raise your hand if you've been thrown something, an initiative, an idea, a new priority with very little explanation. Anybody ever get that? Me too. There's no reason to hide. Here's what we're going to do. Here's why we're going to do it. Here's how we're going to do it. And we're going to support you through it. That's what we need to do. And that's what I'm here to advocate for is building a warm, inviting, non-intimidating, not scary, non-overwhelming data culture in our educational systems. Because if we can do that, we can effectively increase our bottom line, our bottom line being student success. So I urge you, if there is a way to start putting something like this in place, we should do it. Let's build some great data culture in our education. Thank you.